so one should understand that the uh, not the microbes but the human that is homo sapiens is an alien species on the earth and this planet belongs to microbes there are more bacteria on earth than all the living organism together and human body itself contain more number of bacteria than the human cells themselves and we live in a arrogant optimism that we have conquered the infection at least the bacterial infection if not the viruses so i made these slides uh, around 6 or 7 years ago and this was the state of mind of every human that uh, they were more of talking about bacterial infection and they by writing these sentences they were of the opinion that they have conquered the viruses so not only bacteria viruses have again reclaimed their premier position and superiority so the tug of war will keep on going and uh, one will have to be with the tune to treat the things accordingly so it is a general belief that the orthopedic surgeons are arrogant and they tend to shout at everybody you must have observed this thing yes so the fact uh, from the speaking from the horse's mouth is the arrogance is because of the fear yes and fear is out of the infection so they want to prevent infection in all the cases so that fear pushes them to do all these things so that underlines the importance of this topic that is osteomyelitis what is osteomyelitis osteo is a bone myelo is the marrow itis is the inflammation so the easiest definition is infective inflammation of the bone marrow cavity is known as osteomyelitis however there are various extrapolations to this definition we will come across shortly and you can very well understand the stubbornness of this thing from this sentence that uh, once the virginity of the bone is lost it is lost forever right so this is a very stubborn type of infection and uh, one may have to live it for the life if it is not treated accordingly right so it is an infective inflammation of the bone or marrow cavity due to pyogenic organism or other organism resulting in destruction by proteolytic enzyme so it is very important for you to understand that the there is destruction by uh, proteolytic enzymes and necrosis is caused by the obliteration of the blood vessels especially in the metaphyseal zone and reactive hyperemia and inactivity results in decalcification that leads to weakening of the bone and may result in pathological fracture resorption by osteoclast also contribute to that thing and simultaneous reconstruction by osteoblast is the hallmark right feature of all the bone infections so how will you classify it it can be classified according to different methods first and easiest is the duration of symptoms that you can base on the acute osteomyelitis if the symptoms are within 3 weeks beyond 3 weeks to 3 months is the subacute osteomyelitis and beyond 3 months is the chronic osteomyelitis chronic osteomyelitis can be further divided into active or dormant infection depending upon the state of the patient in which he is presenting dormant is also known as quiescent form of infection mode of spread may be endogenous or the hematogenous and the exogenous because of the open fractures or maybe because of the infection following internal fixation of the orthopedic procedures infective organism may be pyogenic or non pyogenic non pyogenic foremost is the tubercular infection so whenever you are talking about acute osteomyelitis it is synonymous with acute hematogenous osteomyelitis unless proved otherwise so acute hematogenous or uh, osteomyelitis is caused by the bacterial seedling from the blood as it is uh, self explanatory from the term it is seen primarily in children and most common site is the metaphysis of the growing end of the long bones in children however it is a very important and pertinent question to be asked in pg entrance viva that uh, the most common site of infection in adults uh, is the vertebral body and not the growing and uh, metaphysis of the long bones right 
so what is the etiology it is uh, most commonly seen in children and with uh, having bimodal peak it is common in children less than 2 years of age and 8 to 12 years of age with male preponderance and metaphyseal around the knee is the most common site that is 60 to 70 percent there are various risk factors uh, one can encounter a preceding history of trauma or some upper uh, upper respiratory tract infection in these patients poor nutrition and unhygienic surrounding also predisposes to all these things other immune deficiency things like like uh, uh, leukopenia or leukocyte dysfunction burns iv catheter iv drug abuse and uh, immunosuppression therapy also predisposes to all these things there is various bacteriology that you must be aware of most common infection is staphylococcus aureus and it is uh, it accounts for up to 90% of the cases if there are multiple lesions streptococcus is another possibility and other bacteria are also uh, observed not infrequently there are specific clinical conditions where one can observe these things in sickle cell anemia patient salmonella osteomyelitis is on the rise however if someone asks you question that what is the most common infection in bone in a patient of sickle cell anemia it will not be salmonella but it will be still as staphylococcus aureus only however the incidence of salmonella infection is more than general population in a case of sickle cell anemia right in uh, drug addicts uh, and food, uh, food punctures where anaerobic things are there pseudomonas infection can be there alcoholism and drug abuse and iv uh, drug abuse and the diabetes cases where the immune deficiency is there streptococcus group g infection can occur and in uh, hiv and other immune suppression fungal infection and mycobacterium avial complex can also be there considering the age group infants the most common uh, infection is staphylococcus aureus or e coli especially if the child is premature and has there been in NICU for a long period of time in otherwise healthy infants in infancy the streptococcus group b infection is one of the commonest one from 1 to 16 years staph aureus remains the most common that is up to 90 percent of the cases and hemophilus influenzae has a specific predilection for three months to three years beyond 16 years again staph aureus or staph epidermidis and other gram negative bacilli play the role so the earliest feature is the inflammation which increases the increased in uh, which increases the intraosseous pressure which leads to intense pain intense pain can lead to uh, push the patient that he will not move the limb so there will be a situation that is known as pseudo paralysis there is no neural or muscular problem but because of the intense pain the patient will refuse to move the limb and uh, the situation will be like uh, pseudo paralysis sort of situation so the second phase is the suppuration suppuration phase where the pus will form in the medullary cavity and through wokman's canal it will be coming out of the surface of the bone to lie in subperiosteal space to form subperiosteal abscess and it will spread along the shaft or re-enter the bone or burst into the soft tissue so there are various mechanisms by which uh, this can spread here and there so this is a very very important slide where you can find that metaphysis is the most common involved area you will be asked in various forums that why the metaphysis of the bone is the most common area involved in osteomyelitis so these are the all the possible uh, possible uh, explanation that you must be aware of and must learn these things by heart it is a highly vascularized zone and pooling of blood results in relative stasis of the blood because of the hairpin bends appearance of the small vessels which causes bacterial seedling there and the infection starts there another is lesser phagocyto phagocytic activity at this zone and high cellular turnover that leads to more immature cells in that zone and uh, which acts as a good culture media Apart from that, there is presence of degenerating cartilage cells, which also acts as a good culture media for the infection to settle. 
and these these arteries those here pin bent they are predominantly the end arteries so this also predisposes the infection to be there and there is a single endothelial lining in the metapithelial arteries that also predisposes one to have infection stasis there so this is a very common and important diagram that you must be aware of so that uh, so that uh, you should uh, you should uh, uh, understand all the patho mechanics in all the age group of the patient so i will explain all the patho mechanics by using this diagram only so you must pay attention to this diagram very importantly right okay so you can see that there is presence of at the end of the bone there is presence of epiphysis okay there is a presence of growth plate or epiphyseal plate and this is the metaphyseal zone and this is the diaphyseal zone of a bone that you are aware of okay so these are the cortices that you can see here as we go up it goes uh, it it becomes a bit thin in the metaphyseal and epiphyseal zone in epiphyseal zone there is predominant cartilage on the end of the bone so that is replaced by them so this is the infection that we are talking about you can see here that the infection started in metaphyseal zone because of all those uh, features listed here in this list right so that infection is started here so there are three ways by which infection can spread here and there first way is infection can go out in this manner via uh, wokeman's canal that uh, i have already overlined here that uh, first at the medulla goes to via wokeman's canal to the surface to superiosteal abscess right next is the infection can go through growth plate to epiphysis the third way of spread is infection can go and spread along the shaft so one must understand that there are three only three ways possible for this infection to spread so so the patient who is in which age group will dictate what sort of what sort of uh, infection he is likely to have so if you have understood this diagram i am going to an next slide and i will get back to this diagram again so the osteomyelitis how will you explain the osteomyelitis in patients younger than 2 years of age so there are some blood vessels that cross the physis that you must uh, you must see here that there are some blood vessels that cross the physis so this is an anatomical fact so what will happen if there are few blood vessels that cross the physis like this so that there is a possibility of infection that will go along these blood vessels from the metaphysis to epiphysis and will involve the epiphysis also so this is this is happening in patients in uh, younger than 2 years of age right so it will lead to involvement of physis and epiphysis and there will be they so if the physis and epiphysis is involved then they become more susceptible for the for the shortening and the deformity so this is a very important point to note that because of this thing there is a abnormal phenomena going on that the infection is crossing the barrier of the physis and going to involve the epiphysis so that will lead to uh, more susceptibility for the infection and the shortening in addition in patient younger than 2 years of age there is presence of thin metaphyseal cortex so it will lead to early periosteal abscess formation right so i am coming back to again so there are presence of these thin thin uh, blood vessels that cross across the physis in patients younger than 2 years of age so that will lead to spread of this infection towards the physis and epiphysis so that will lead to growth disturbances in addition there is presence of thin cortices in patients in younger than 2 years of age they are not thick 
so that will lead to penetration of these cortices by the infection and uh, infection is more likely to grow in this direction as well as in this direction this direction will lead to development of abscess in the subperiosteal space sub periosteum may also be perforated if not treated on time and it may burst outside the skin also and it will lead to involvement of the physis and epiphysis and lead to growth disturbances so because the pus has formed these two ways to spread it will not be going here it will not go here so if it is not going towards the diaphysis then the extensive diaphyseal sequestration sequestration means dead dead bone so the diaphysis will not be involved in patients who are younger than 2 years of age so extensive diaphyseal sequestration is not likely to happen and which leads to uh, good uh, good prognosis as well as uh, shaft is concerned but it is a bad prognostic feature as well uh, yeah, as far as uh, uh the the growth plate and the subperiosteal abscess is concerned right so if you have there is another peculiar phenomena that uh, there are four places in proximal femur proximal humerus radial neck and the distal fibula where there is presence of physis within the joint capsule so if the patients are having infection in these areas and uh, and uh, the infection is spreading along the open channels across the physis through blood vessels this sort of infection can uh, this sort of infection in the bone can lead to secondary infection of the joint like for proximal femur infection the septic arthritis of hip can develop for proximal humerus infection the septic arthritis of shoulder can develop for radial neck uh involvement there is the possibility of septic arthritis of elbow likewise in distal fibula there is septic arthritis of ankle joint that can develop so this is an very important information and commonly asked in multiple choice questions across uh, various forums and uh, it is also very easy understanding that i am telling you so what happens in next age group the, that is the age group from beyond 2 years till the physial fusion so in in the age group the physial plate acts as a absolute barrier to the spread of infection towards the epiphysis or the joint so there are no blood vessels that cross the physis and physis acts as a complete barrier additionally there is presence of thick metaphysial cortices that prevent early spread to dia and then that that uh, prevents uh, spread uh, through uh, subperiosteal abscess so it leads to early spread to diaphysis so how it develops in patients age group beyond 2 years until physial maturity this part of the bone acts as a complete barrier for the spread of infection towards the joint so this infection is not likely to go here not likely there is presence of thick cortices in the metaphysial in this age group so this sort of spread is also not very conducive they they may still present like this also but they will present a, a barrier for the spread of infection towards this area so the pus is finding the easy way out to go towards the diaphysis so extensive diaphyseal sequestration where there is presence of large sequestrum formation in the diaphysis will occur at the at this age group and uh, a long tubular sequestrum whole of uh, virtually whole of the bone shaft will be replaced by a uh, 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 tubular sort of sequestrum and the bone will have to form a new bone that is known as ill bone lucrum that i will briefly cover so what will happen in what if the osteomyelitis is occurring in patients after physial closure so in this age group that is beyond 18 years of age acute hematogenous osteomyelitis is very rare and it is only seen in immune suppressed uh, individuals vertebral body is the most common site in adults and it is a slow spread of infection large sequestra will rarely form and physial barrier will no longer exist 
so again there may be a spread of infection to epiphyseal area and the adjacent joint in these four areas that i have outlined in the age group less than 2 years of age so that will still again hold true for these cases so the patient will be in intense pain leading to pseudo paralysis there will be fever malaise tenderness restricted adjacent joint movements like the patient is having osteomyelitis of the distal femur so it is likely to have restricted joint movement of the knee joint and likewise then there will be redness edema and the warmth signifying pus inside and there will be history preceding skin lesion or the sore throat or the minor trauma before that so radiographs are not very conclusive in first 10 days will not show any abnormality except for the increase of tissue shadows of the pus by the end of second week periosteal reaction that is the new bone formation will be apparent on the x rays mm -hmm. and the signs of rarefaction will start appearing in the metaphyses so if someone is uh, someone is uh, obtaining the x ray and uh, seeing these features at uh, after 10 or 10 or 14 days so that means that the the treatment has already been uh, quite late and these sorts of patients are more likely to go in chronic osteomyelitis sort of picture even after treated now after two weeks there will be sclerosis and the thickening of the bone and it is a very important understanding that one must be um, aware of that approximately 30 to 50% of the open bone loss is necessary to cause detectable lucencies in the plain x rays ultrasound may demonstrate changes in early and uh, it uh, can pick the abnormalities like soft tissue abscess and the fluid collection and the periosteal elevation quite early so there are where areas are not accessible to clinical examination it allows ultrasound guided aspiration of the pus joint for diagnostic purposes right however there it is operator dependent and does not allow evaluation of the bone part mri will again help in early inflammatory things and uh, it will detect the bone marrow and the soft tissue quite easily it has a quite high sensitivity but it is a one must understand that it is a sophisticated sophisticated uh, investigation and one should not try to get it done in every cases it should be reserved for early diagnosis of doubtful cases and uh, additionally one should not wait for the mri to happen to be performed later on for these patient in some manner and uh, suppose you gave mri requisition to somebody and they went on getting in queue for mri appointment for mri so that may be a long story and uh, if the the precious time of decompressing the bone is lost in the early phase then this patient is likely to land on in chronic osteomyelitis that may persist for long may be for life so one should not wait for the mri to be done or one should not wait for the x ray changes to appear to treat osteomyelitis so this is a very important message that i want to give that it is reserved for only limited cases should not be prescribed for each and every cases likewise for bone scan also it is also reserved for early diagnosis of doubtful cases and as well as for the research activities so these are the these are the uh, few bone scans that you must be aware of that may be asked in your mcq examination also that which one of the following is not which one of the following bone scan is not indicative of uh, uh, that can detect infection sort of thing so it is technetium 99 bone scan gallium 67 indium 111 level leukocyte bone scan however these are not likely to differentiate infection from the tumor in majority of the cases so there will be raised leukocyte count raised esr and crp levels crp levels are uh, more useful than esr because uh, it uh, decreases uh, rapidly once the therapy has been instituted and the effect has started coming in while the esr takes long time and it is also non specific so another uh, very good investigation is uh, you aspirate the area of the involvement from a thick bore needle that is 16 or 18 gauge needle from the sub periosteal space and uh, the resultant aspiration of the pus can be sent for various diagnostic purposes blood culture may also be positive in half of the patients
So this is you can see a plain film radiograph that is showing osteomyelitis of the second metacarpal periosteal elevation, cortical disruption, and the medullary involvement are present. So there are obvious radiological features present here. So probably we are quite late in treating this patient, and this patient is likely to uh, develop chronic osteomyelitis and uh, maybe chronic discharging sinus uh, for life and will require various reconstructive procedures. Likewise, another appearance on the radiograph where the uh, in detection of the infection was quite late, AP and lateral view radiograph of an skeletally immature patient showing ankle joint where there is the presence of lucency in the tibial metaphysis, tibial distal metaphysis, secondary to acute hematogenous osteomyelitis and probably the infection must have been there for two weeks or so before such sort of radiological pictures do appear. So we are again probably uh, late in treating this patient also. So one should not wait for these signs to appear. So as well as treatment point of view is concerned, one must be aware of NAIDS criteria that were established in 1983. And it is uh, also holding its fold till now also. These are the five things that should be uh, understand uh, understood in a sequential manner only. Not that you tell fifth one as the first and uh, second one as the fourth. No. So this is the sequential thing that you must uh, understand. So an appropriate antibiotic will be effective before the pus formation, right? And antibiotics will not sterilize a vascular tissue or the abscess such as such areas will require surgical removal. If the removal is effective, antibiotics should prevent their reformation and primary wound closure should be safe. So these are the two repercussions of this, that if you are uh, debriding the or decompressing the bone effectively, uh, the antibiotic should prevent the reformation of this abscess and primary wound coverage should be safe. So surgery should be done in such a manner that it uh, should not uh, should not further damage the already ischemic bone and the soft tissues. Antibiotics should be continued even after surgery. So these are the beautiful five lines that uh, that summarizes the treatment of acute hematogenous osteomyelitis so well. So the principle of the treatment remains: uh, you should give pain relief to the small kid and general supportive measure like IV fluid there he may not be eating or uh, taking fluids well for quite a long period of time since he has been unwell so IV fluid support may be required rest and splintage of the affected part to give pain relief antibiotics and the surgical eradication of the pus and necrotic tissue by decompressing the bone so why I am telling the decompression because if it is not uh, treated by surgical method in time it may lead to extensive diaphyseal sequestration so decompression is something like that patient the bone will be relieved of any increased intraosseous pressure and the related uh, secondary complications like involvement of epiphysis through physis or extensive diaphyseal sequestration or involvement of vortices through the pus so it will decompress the pus so this is a very important uh, consideration that uh, it is commonly asked to various students that uh, how long will you give antibiotic? How long will you give IV antibiotic? So uh, duration of antibiotic therapy is important and in duration separate first is how long for IV and how long for oral. So these are the specific uh, guidelines that have been laid. So one should start the treatment with IV antibiotics for first uh, one or two weeks. Then oral may be initiated to complete the total course of six weeks. However, there is another important consideration that as soon as CRP levels and the clinical profile of the level improves and it comes down, then IV may be shifted to oral form. So this is also a good answer that you can utilize and uh, utilize in your clinical practice also. So at the time of surgery, initially the empirical antibiotics are started and uh, cultures are taken. And as soon as the culture reports are available, sensitivity pattern 
uh, should be seen and uh, appropriate antibiotic should be started so what all are the complications of the acute hematogenous osteomyelitis first and foremost is the that it can cause chronic osteomyelitis that uh, if not treated on time so whenever there is a patient that you see in your clinical practice whether you opt in a field of pediatrics or community medicine or a medicine where someone consults you for his or her son or daughter that he is having suspected case of chronic osteomyelitis so don't uh, write uh, staple prescription of x-ray ultrasound mri start an empirical antibiotic and painkillers and send the patient home so this is not to be done because you may be harming the patient for life if he or she develops chronic osteomyelitis and it will be a nuisance for him or her for the life so if you are not an orthopedic surgeon you should suspect this Uh, pathology and should uh, refer that uh, patient to appropriate orthopedic surgeon who will treat this according to the norms that uh, i have briefed just now so it can also lead to growth disturbances growth disturbances as you can very well understand by this discussion till now will happen in patient will less than 2 years of age because there is presence of Uh, patent blood vessels that cross the barrier of the physis and the infection from the metaphysis can go to epiphysis pathological fractures can happen if there is a radiological lucency and uh, lucency will appear when the 30 to 50% of the cortical bone has been lost so muscle contracture can develop if not treated on time and secondary septicemia can happen as you are aware that up to 50% of the cases do show isolation of the bacteria through the blood culture joint stiffness amyloidosis can happen and hansen have outlined the seven d's associated with all these things the despair divorce destitute depression delinquency default and death associated with the complication which has been briefly uh, briefly outlined here so i will now briefly cover the topic of chronic osteomyelitis after the completion of acute osteomyelitis so if anybody wants to ask anything can drop in some question here in the comment section and i will proceed now then so chronic osteomyelitis is majority of the time is a sequela of untreated acute osteomyelitis or inadequately treated acute osteomyelitis or hematogenous spread of the low virulence organism or infection through the external wound so the percentage of these cases turning into acute chronic osteomyelitis are decreasing because of the increased awareness of its pathogenesis and uh, wide spread treatment options available across all the areas are leading to decrease the possibility in this however in increased commercialization and the speed of the life which is causing more and more open fractures in young adults so the percentage of these patients are on a rise that uh, there are the open fracture cases are on a rise because of all these increased uh, speed of the life and in more and more road road traffic accidents fall from height and all these things are increasing that are increasing the possibility of exogenous form of um, harboring the infection and the chronic osteomyelitis out of that so one must understand the term that is sequestrum so sequestrum is a dead piece of bone that has been dead because of the spread of the infection and uh, it resultant devoid of the blood vessels blood supply of that zone so sequestrum how will you how will you uh, define sequestrum sequestrum is a dead piece of bone surrounded by unhealthy granulation tissue so one must be quite clear with the definition sequestrum is a dead piece of bone surrounded by unhealthy granulation tissue and next comes the involucrum involucrum is the new bone that the body is forming as a reaction to the infection inside the body so sequestrum is the dead so gradually the sequestrum will form and involucrum will form over it and gradually it will replace the sequestrum in some cases where there will be self resolution of the pathology 
However, if the sequestrum remains there, then it will lead to development of discharging sinuses. And how the discharging sinuses will appear? It will appear through cloacae in the in involucrum. Involucrum will develop certain holes through which the sequestrum will discharge outside the discharging sinuses. And this is the this is the quite suggestive history that there will be a discharge of bony spicules from the wound. So if somebody is giving this history that the bony spicules are coming out of the wound, then it is a hallmark feature of chronic osteomyelitis. So if any clinical case is given to you in your exam and you are able to elicit this history that there is a discharge of, discharge of uh, bony spicule through the wound, then the diagnosis of chronic osteomyelitis is clinched. So there are various uh, forms of sequestrum. Tubular sequestrum is formed in the fulminant pyogenic infection. So can anyone tell then when the tubular sequestrum will be formed? In which age group? It will be formed in age group more than two years till 18 years because there is a presence of thick metaphyseal cortices and the growth plate acts as a barrier to the spread of infection to epiphysis. So the pus will be pushed towards the diaphysis leading to extensive diaphyseal sequestration. Whole of the diaphysis will be converted into sequestrum and it will form a sequestrum in the form of a tubule. So it is a fulminant pyogenic infection in age group more than two years till physial closure and will lead to this sort of sequestrum formation. So the coke and sand sequestrum is formed in tuberculosis. Dense ivory sequestrum is formed in the cases of syphilis infection. And ring sequestrum is formed around the steenman pin, pin track or around the uh, amputation stump. So why do they form pin track around the pin track? What will happen? There will be presence of uh, bone that has been uh, uh, dead because of the increased temperature of the pin that has been inserted inside the bone. So the increased temperature of the bone around the pin track it will lead to this form and again amputation stump is formed because because uh, we cut it through the giggly saw. So if it is not irrigated well during the surgery there will be a raised temperature across the stump site. So that will lead to ring sequestrum, localized ring sequestrum at the end of the bone in the amputation stump. Similarly, calcaneal osteomyelitis, the, it is specific for Bombay uh, sequestrum to form. So this is a clinical picture of chronic osteomyelitis where you can see a lot of uh, discolorative changes around in, uh, in the surrounding skin, the presence of exposed bone and the discharging sinus in the wound. You can see that the ankle is also forming contracture in the equinus. The, the infection is quite evident from the removed dressing that has been swelled here. So these are the clinical pictures that you will commonly encounter. And this is the patient who is skeletally immature. And you can see that there is presence of long tubular sequestrum in the diaphysis, which is seen here also, right? So I am rubbing it off so that you can see it again. So from this appearance, what will you interpret? When would this patient be having this infection? The infection must have come from here. Since the patient was having the age group more than two years till 18 years or physical fusion, so growth plate must have resisted the spread of infection to epiphysis. Thick cortices must have resisted the infection to spread towards the uh, outside of the bone. So the infection must have led to extensive diaphysial sequestration by involving the diaphysis and forming of this this uh, tubular sort of sequestrum here. So you can see a hole within the involucrum that the new bone has been formed over it. The new bone is generally rough in consistency. 
and this sort of hole through which the discharging sinus appears on the skin is known as cloacae that i have already outlined okay so how will you classify chronic osteomyelitis chronic osteomyelitis is classified according to the classification outlined in 1985 by cierne and mather and they they identified two things first of all they identified the anatomical type so there are four anatomical type first is the medullary chronic osteomyelitis where there is presence of sequestrum inside the medulla second there is presence of superficial chronic osteomyelitis so not whole of the cortex but part of the cortex is dead the superficial portion of the cortex is dead in the form of chronic osteomyelitis it commonly happens when there is uh, skin loss following uh, some road traffic accident but there is no bone fracture so the bone lies bare especially in the shin of the tibia so the superficial part of the bone turns uh, dead and uh, various sorts of reconstructive procedure then needs to be done the third form is localized osteomyelitis where there is presence of involvement of whole of the cortex on one side as well as of the medulla however the bone is not weak the, this sort of infection is not geoparding the stability of the bone as you can see here that there is involvement of one cortex and other two cortices are okay so it will not lead to need for any additional stabilization procedure for the bone and uh, this sort of infection needs to be treated and the fourth one is the diffuse one where the infection is there in both cortex as well as in the medulla in different areas which is geoparding geoparding the stability of the bone so this was the first part of the cierne and mother classification that was the anatomical type there are four types in it this is the second part so second part is physiological class so they divided it into uh, a host b host and the c host so they termed it a host when there is presence of good host immunity so like a normal immune competent individual will be classified in a host this is the second physiological class that i am talking about b host will be a compromised host where uh, there will be presence of either the local compromising factors like the skin condition is poor the skin coverage is poor the healing potential of the skin appears poor and the systematically compromised like there is presence of diabetes and other uh, systematic uh, illnesses that is uh, preventing the compromised host and c is the combined where there is presence of both locally as well as systematically compromised host so b will be divided into bl bs and bc and the c host is the prohibitive host so it is very important you to know what is the meaning of prohibitive host prohibitive host means they are not the surgical candidates if you do surgery in these patients they are likely to likely to suffer more than the disease process itself so they are the ones who are having uh, such a disability from the systematic disease that you should not be operating on these they have minimal disability because of the infection and other comorbidities that are precluding their uh, surgery part of thing so the treatment becomes worse than the disease itself and they are not the surgical candidates also known as prohibitive right so the final staging is uh, determined by a clinical stage so the final diagnosis is given in clinical stage which combines the anatomical type and the physiological class so if you want to describe a case of diffuse osteomyelitis chronic osteomyelitis in tibia in a systematically compromised host so diffuse sort of appearance becomes four right and uh, systematically compromised the host is compromised so it becomes b and it is a systematically compromised so 4bs so the diagnosis will be found as a 
clinical stage 4b s according to crna and mother classification right so these are the various treatment options available here this sort of technique is known as papineo technique or also known as open bone grafting so what will happen this is a uh, wound with chronic osteomyelitis uh, you open the wound and uh, did a thorough debridement where you will you found that the bony edges are bleeding so paparica sign is present where there is presence of bleeding across the exposed bone so that is a good indication for you to put cancellous bone grafting in the cavity so cancellous bone grafting is done and it is left open so gradually there will be presence of granulation red healthy granulation tissue over the surface of the cancellous bone that can be treated later on either by local closure or by myoplasty or by the free bone transplant so this uh, this sort of uh, treatment has resulted in good outcome in various patients across decades this is not a new technique it must be decades old so this is the this was the infection where in first stage you cleared everything and you can see that it has been cleared in a wide manner so a saucer like appearance that you can see of the bone that has been formed after that debridement so this procedure is known as saucerization so saucerization what it, did you do after doing saucerization you did sequestectomy you removed the sequestrum right so what will you term this procedure that i did sequestectomy following saucerization and uh, uh, this sort of papineo technique that you can see here they put the cancellous bone graft here over which once the granulation tissue appears so depending upon whether the local coverage is available skin grafting is available myoplasty procedure is available or the bone coverage through uh, free bone transfer procedure is available will be done so this is a case that i treated uh, a few time ago that was a case uh, you can see a long incision scar here so that was a case of iatrogenic infection this was the and you can see these multiple staples here can you see so this is the procedure of harvesting the saphenous vein for cardio bypass surgery cabg cardio uh, coronary artery bypass grafting so the patient had uh, coronary artery disease for which uh, this saphenous vein was harvested and was put in the chest for the purpose of bypass and they closed the wound like this subsequently patient developed this infection and there was presence of discharging sinus here through which the bony spicules were discharging so on getting the x ray this is the x ray after one year of the coronary artery bypass grafting that there was presence of radiolucent area in the anterior cortex of the tibia mid shaft so we did a special investigation that is known as sinogram so what do you do in sinogram you inject this is a syringe this is a syringe through which you are injecting a dye which is a radio opaque dye within the uh, sinus and uh, you can very well see that the dye is going towards the osteolytic lesion thus confirming the diagnosis that it is going towards that and it is originating from there on ct scan you saw there is presence of superficial form of superficial form of chronic osteomyelitis and the sequestrum was sitting there right in the center so we opened it and we removed this sort of this this much area to lay wide open area in the bone and which resulted in clinical resolution of the symptoms so this was later on turned out to be a case of osteomyelitis secondary to tuberculosis so tuberculosis infection was implanted inside during the surgical procedure and this was subsequently published in a reputed journal so just to summarize there are few more miscellaneous conditions that you may come across in your various mcqs exams 
there is presence of subacute sclerosing osteomyelitis of GAR, also known as idiopathic cortical sclerosis, where infants and young children are affected, and the long bone. Tibia has more predilection than the femur for this infection, and it has been postulated that this infection is caused by the anaerobic bacteria. And symptoms are because of the infl infective inflammation, but there are no sinuses or the discharge because it is caused by the low grade infection. And symmetrical thickening of the cortex and the narrowing of the metabolic cavity is seen. Cultures are negative majority of the time and fenestration is recommended with antibiotics. Another form of uh, infection is Brody's abscess where there is a localized form of chronic osteomyelitis by low virulence organism and it occurs in young adults nearing their skeletal maturity. So 15 to 20 years of age is the most common age of predilection and the long bone, especially the distal tibia metaphysical zone is the area of predilection. Osteolytic area with a ring of uh, surrounding dense sclerosis is the hallmark radiological feature and Staphylococcus aureus is cultured in half of the cases and curettage is the treatment of choice. So this is a typical example of Brody's abscess where you can see the area and surrounding area of sclerosis. So I am rubbing it off so that you can see the surrounding area of sclerosis quite easily. And this is the uh, Brody's abscess in the very rare presentation of the Brody's abscess in the epiphyseal zone of the distal femur. So there is another uh, quite commonly asked question is the chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. It is uh, exclusively seen in adolescent age group and it has a long fluctuating clinical course. So this is a question which is uh, being asked in your difficult uh, MCQs and you must pay attention to it that there has been some association which has been established between the chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis and the SAFO syndrome. So what is SAFO syndrome? So it can also be asked in your MCQs that which one of the following is not constituting a part of SAFO. So SAFO is synovitis, S for synovitis, A for acne over face and upper back, P for palmoplantar pustulosis, H for hyperostosis and O for osteitis. So it uh, commonly involves multiple sites and most common being are the anterior chest wall and the sternoclavicular area, either sternum or clavicle. So one must be able to see the association whether the chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis is a spectrum of SOFO syndrome or not. So another form is direct inoculation osteomyelitis or exogenous form of osteomyelitis in sharp contrast to acute hematogenous one, which is endogenous. So the most common is the post-traumatic followed by the post-surgery, that is hydrogen. So it depends upon the grade of open fracture that the patient are uh, presenting with. And uh, to prevent uh, this post-surgical hydrogenic bone infection, one must be uh, very particular about maintaining the asepsis in orthopedic OT and all the precautions are being taken to ensure there is a presence of adequate sterilization of instruments, adequate sterilization of implants, adequate uh, hand hygiene of all the operation uh, theater staffs, you know, those who are going to operate. So we were on the verge of uh, starting a study on the hand hygiene uh, uh, there are various methods to detect whether the hand hygiene is adequately maintained in the OT staff or not, but because of the unfortunate events of the corona pandemic, that study has still been on hold. And uh, uh, this is a final year MBBS student. So one of your batchmate, uh, Harshita, was about to conduct that study. So let's see if we are able to initiate that uh, study in near future for ICMR once the OT opens. So prophylaxis is the key in preventing the uh, infection uh, through surgery that, that develops through surgery. And uh, the predisposing factors are debility, chronic conditions, and the previous infection and the corticosteroid therapy. So one must be aware of the open fractures also. There are uh, there is a Gaskillo and Anderson classification system. 
in which uh, he classified uh, lecture types into type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 3 were further classified in uh, 3a 3b and 3c so there is a, that you will separately separately read in uh, open lecture or you must have already covered in other talks so there is a 2% possibility of type 1 of developing into chronic osteomyelitis in type 1 gastillo and darson 7% possibility in type 2 and type 3a 10 to 50% possibility in type 3b and 25 to 50% possibility in type 3c this is a high figure considering that many of the patient would require amputation also so barring that this is a quite high figure right so i think i have covered majority of the aspects pertaining to pertaining to uh, acute and chronic osteomyelitis so i would wait for a couple of minutes if you want to drop in any message showing any difficulty or inability to understand anything i will be happy to help for those who are clear from their point of view so they can uh, leave and proceed to next session wherever they are involved so i think we should end the session now so thank you everybody and you can proceed on to your next session now